Good evening. Uh, welcome. Thank you so much for your patience. My name is Lynn Cook. I'm the organizer of this series with the able help of Kristen Poor and Patrick Heilman, and uh, with the ongoing support of Art for Art's Sake, for whom we're enormously grateful. It's a pleasure to introduce Tony Fair, who's going to be speaking on Flavin. I'm going to make it very brief and say Tony arrived in New York in 1981 and started showing internationally. From 1991, he currently shows, had a show last year at uh, Pace Wildenstein and Amelia Terrasse, which many of you may have seen. And in 2007, he had a, one, a show at the Indianapolis Museum of Art with the extraordinary title, Tony Fair, a single act of carelessness will result in the eternal loss of beauty. I think it's his birthday next week. Please join me in welcoming Tony and wishing him a happy birthday. Patrick, thank you for getting this in working shape. Uh, I guess everyone can hear me. Thank you all for coming. I was hoping that no one would show up. It would be easier t to speak to an empty room, but I guess that's not what's gonna happen. Um, I've always been interested in artworks that reveal an honesty. Uh, the directness of the material, the directness of how it reveals itself. And Dan Flavin's work has always seemed to me to be extremely honest in that sense. It is what it is. It's a light bulb and it's a fixture. And as I understand his story, he uh, discovered them on Canal Street, um, back when Canal Street was Canal Street with five hardware stores and four electronics and five plastic places and uh, coming upon that um, and, and choosing that material. Obviously, he comes from a time when there was a lot of experimentation uh, in finding a new voice out of abstract expressionism and uh, pop. Um, the artists in Soho and, and downtown were uh, working with a very unusual medium and technique. Uh, uh, Richard Serres throwing molten lead in the corner and uh, a lot of, uh, lot of artists, the uh, minimalists are developing their format with a very simple, by the use of very simple means. And uh, Flavin comes out of that time. And at one point when I was thinking about this, I thought, it's really interesting. I wonder if this work would have ever happened were it not for his location. Is this something that really is about his time and his place? Were he an artist in another city that didn't have that kind of, not simply the energy, but the actual the availability of finding this, this object and deciding that he could use it? So it seems so interesting to me that the work really um, comes from a very specific place. Uh, which is here in New York City and in that time. And with this idea of the directness and the immediacy, I've always felt that there was something uh, about Flavin that seemed very essential. And I realize that essentialism is maybe, as a philosophic idea, is probably not what I mean, but it's, it's almost as if it is of the essence of a larger cosmic understanding. Now, that's a little corny, perhaps, but <clears throat> whenever one starts, when you start talking about, oh, the cosmic reality, you can get a little touchy, but um, what, I'm sp what I mean is that because it, there's a reality to the physical presence of the bulb and the action of the electrons, passing through a gas, it's creating a reaction that is being revealed by uh, the expulsion of heat slash light in the form of visible light. It's the exact same physical process that's happening all through the cosmos. It is electrons and it's electromagnetic energy. I studied a lot of science when I was in school and um, science, again, is a 
there's an honesty to what science, uh, how you think in science. It's you, you abandon prejudice, you set aside preconceived notions, and you look for the truth. And you look for a truth that is um, substantiated by observable phenomena. And sometimes you don't get the answer you want or what you thought you wanted, but you get at a truth. And I l like that kind of thinking. And I always found that to be very beautiful, that striving for honesty. <clears throat> I'm not going to go into my personal life too much, but maybe if you grow up where there's not a lot of truth floating around, that maybe honesty and truth in, 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 uh, in, your li in life is just something that I find very um, compelling. And there's an honesty to, that I read to the work of Dan Flavin. And in that, that sort of overarching cosmic way that the tube itself of light is emitting this electromagnetic energy that we read as visible light. And I just find that so exciting because I, I, I understand it as what's happening and this light is coming out, and it's not, it, there's a vibrating wave, but it's coming out at us like this. It just comes and comes and comes and comes, and it just never stops. And it's, I mean, it reminds me of Zoe said yesterday about the waterfall, just kept going and kept going, and it never stopped. It's just going to stop. And it just keeps coming. As long as the electrons are going, it just keeps coming on out. At you, at you, at you, and you're just completely swarmed and surrounded by it. <clears throat> and then deconstructing actually what's going on of a vacuum tube that has a certain uh, chemical mix and atom uh, molecules and d different elements in there, and you send in a, a, a stream of electrons through it, and it activates that, and it makes the light. But if you, you have to... F it, so it's, it's the source of its own... Um, the artwork is its own source. It, the, it's producing its light. So it's, it's projecting the light. And how we see is 99% by reflection. <clears throat> I'm a little dry, sorry. We see by reflection. So the ambient light in this room is bouncing off of something, and that's how we see it. And I, I, again, this might be a little bit uh, like everybody understands that. But as I think about that, most artwork is obviously seen by reflection. And this is an artwork that generates its own light. Of course, it's not really generating it. It's the result of something that's generating because you can follow the electron stream back down the wires, down to the basement, down to Con Ed, and back to an actual... <laughs> thank you. Thank you. back to the actual source of the electron generation, which, whether it's burning of gas, coal, or uh, at an atomic level, nuclear fission, creating heat, which is making the steam, which is turning the turbine, which is sending that, it's as if the artwork that's on the wall has a hidden tail, and you can, it's connected, and the power plant on the back is somehow part of the piece. Um, and I, I, I don't know, I just, I like that. I like thinking that it's connected way off somewhere. <clears throat> so we have the projection of the light, and we have the reflection of the light. And the sun, obviously, projects. It's burning its fuel. The tubes are burning their fuel, and they eventually will use up the fuel, and it will go out the sun will go out three billion years from now, but it burns something on the order of 100 million tons of hydrogen a second. But it will burn out. It will swell to be a red, dwar a red giant. It will get to the size that it will expand to a size that will incorporate the orbit of Mars. We will, this planet and the whole system will be vaporized. 
Jupiter and Saturn, the gas planets, will evaporate into space. And then as the fuel gets down to nothing, it collapses on itself in a catastrophic event and explodes into a supernova. On a much smaller scale, <laughs> we understand that light bulbs act, act in the exact same way. They burn their fuel, and we all know that when you go to turn a light on and it pops, that's its red, giant, white dwarf stage. It's used up and there's no more. And the flavins will do the same thing because there's a finite number of, a finite amount of material inside the tube that the electrons can react with. Now, my science background, I'm just, I visualize this, I can see all these electrons running around and everything getting excited and glowing and I just think it's just fantastic. I don't think it has that much to do really with the art because that has to exist separate. But you have to get there somehow and that's how that gets there and I like the journey. <clears throat> and speaking about the again with the reflection. So Flavin has projection of light and reflection of light because it reflects off the wall. So you have two types of light that's happening. And as I was saying, we all see by reflection. So I, this got me thinking one time about, well, what is it that we're really seeing? And I always have an example of a red cube. One of these days, I'm going to have to actually make one. But Say that you have a cube and it's red. It's the paint that's red. Light is hitting that and it reflects into our eye. That's what we see. But what's happening is it's only the red wavelength that's reflecting. Everything else is being absorbed. So I had this picture that maybe something red isn't actually red. Maybe the little cube is sitting there going, oh, get away, red, get away, get away. It's rejecting it. So maybe... Nothing is the color that we see it is. It's the combination of everything that isn't being rejected. And then that made me think about plants and how universally green is the color of life. But the plant is saying, go away, green. I can't use you. And plants absorb red light and blue light. That's the energy that fuels photosynthesis. Is it really green? It doesn't want it. Anyway, I thought that's fun. <clears throat> Projection and reflection and how we see the sun, all of those things I think are very exciting. But the idea, of course, art can't be concerned with those mechanisms. It has to exist from a different point of view from our mind. <clears throat> so, well, we, we, so now we're okay. The, the, the device itself, go back, back to that for a second. And there's a given with that. If you've chosen that object, and I fully don't understand his motivation, only because I didn't want to read too much about it, because I didn't want this to be an academic talk about what I learned about Dan Flavin. It's my response and my. Uh, feelings about the work and how I relate to it. And in my own journey as an artist, I came to a place where I started to accept the given circumstances of objects around me and taking advantage of things that were around, whether a bottle, a crate, a marble, a coin. Uh, and it's in the same way that he accepted the, the possibilities as well as the limitations of the light fixture. And it's, I guess the fixture is analogous to a, a stretcher for a painting. The painting is not really contingent on the stretcher. You can paint on a wall. You have to have a surface, obviously, but it could be anything. And if you turn a painting to the wall, is it still art? Or is the art the response you have to the surface that you can see that the artist employed. 
And painters obviously go, and that's been a dilemma, and it's something that's been um, explored. Uh, there are many artists who uh, shape the canvas and cut through and shape uh, the stretcher. And, and so it's an, it, there's an investigation about that. So a question I have asked myself about the work of Dan Flavin is, is it art when it's not plugged in? What, at what point does it, it has the potential of being a work of art if he designated those things and they are, they're in his realm, so it is, but not any fixture, not any uh, just fluorescent fixture on the wall or on the ceiling somewhere, that's not Dan Flavin, and it's not art. And I don't have an answer, but it's a curious question. So if it's not plugged in, is it art? And so if it is plugged in, then I'm back to the necessity of the electrons as part of the medium. <laughs> waiting for somebody to say something, but um, I, guess that, I guess that's my job right now, right? <laughs> so there's so many ways of seeing with the, with the flavor and the projection and the... Um, the reflection, but as I was saying with the, the physicality of the device itself, it creates a shadow. And I've always loved that shadow. There's a dimension to the box, the bulb projects equally around, but the fixture blocks some of the light, so there's this little wedge of shadow that runs down the side. I've always, I just, I want to get in that shadow. I want to get behind the light. And it just seems like a safe place. It's sort of like being the, not the deer in the headlight, but the driver of the car. You're behind the light. You can see. You're back in there. Nobody can see you. <clears throat> and when, when you have ambient light in the room, there's some light that's going in there. That's why you can see it. Um, if it's in a darkened room, it's a very different situation and the line is more pronounced. <clears throat> I recall one time in Miami uh, having the occasion to visit the Rebel Collection. Uh, I think it was the first Miami Basel or it might have been the year before Amata Cruz did a show that I was involved with. Anyway, there was some kind of a shuttle bus and we wound up there and it's a big, it's an, a big concrete bunker. It's a former DEA warehouse. And of course, you know, they have a fantastic collection. Uh, a lot of uh, sort of current hits, dogs and teacups and smiley face flowers and a lot of stuff going on. I'm like, okay, that's great, you know. I, 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 I tend to like things that are a little more subtle, but there's this kind of a whole three ring circus going on. And I think, oh, it's, you know, they're great collectors. It's a great collection. It's fantastic. You have, we have, you know, we have to have patrons of the art. It's fantastic. But I noticed there was a wall that had a gap at the end. It looked like you'd go around. Actually, I thought that's where the restrooms were. But I ran the corner, and oh, my goodness. There were maybe five or so Flavins on the wall in a room that had no other lighting. And I... I it was as, as if looking into the night sky at these stars. They were just so perfectly beautiful. The space was gorgeous. The light that admitted, it was so calm. It was so beautiful. They had some kind of Corbusier seating. And it was just a, a, a fast, it was just a wonderful experience. But I kind of thought, well, is that corny to have a light sculpture without any lights on else in there? Or is it, is it too dramatic? And, uh, well, you know, sometimes you turn the lights off. Sometimes the lights are on. Um, you see Flavins that are installed in front of windows. So he's obviously uh, compensating or working with direct light, with daylight. But at the same time, uh, for example, like the piece that's at uh, Donald Judd's loft on, on uh, Spring Street, it's in front of a window, and it's also in a domestic space, so it's going to be seen during the day is going to be seen at night without any lights on. So 
perhaps he was, you know, aware of all of that and wanted all, all of that to happen. <clears throat> and to take advantage of, of the different ways that the work, uh, that you perceive the work under those different conditions. <clears throat> it was a very beautiful experience. The um, Hubble Space Telescope, there was this um, a deep space uh, photograph that was taken was a few years ago. Uh, and these uh, the scientists who work with the Hubble wanted to make the deepest uh, probe into the cosmos that has ever that had ever been done at that time. And what they did is they picked in the night sky, there are regions where there are a lot of stars and there are some regions where there are not so many stars. And they picked an area where there were no stars and they focused on a spot in the sky the size of your thumbnail. <clears throat> and they, they set the, the Hubble and it over a period of time, it gets back to the same spot, it opens up its lens and it looks, and it does it over like a period of a month. They didn't know what they were gonna find. Nobody had ever looked that far back into space time before. The picture that was revealed, it's full of galaxies. And because it's a false color compilation of many different uh, ways of reading light, there was red and blue and green and amber and it was all sparkly. As if, as if a handful of jewels were tossed out on on a piece of velvet, and it was stunning. The the astrophysicists and the, the astronomers did not expect that. Well, the Flavins looked to me like that, like they had been plucked from the farthest reaches of the cosmos. And I thought, I, again, that's sort of like brings it all back with my science and the sun and connecting, and then it, it's a source of its own uh, energy, and it's just profound. Now, 14 billion light years is an inconceivable distance and time. Most people can't come up with the distance between here and Boston. They can't really... Uh, the moon is 186,000 miles away. The sun's 93 million miles away. What the hell is 14 billion light years? My God, we can't possibly understand it. But I, I just, I, I think that that reality for me <clears throat> is so much more exciting than the mythologies that we've created to explain the things that we think we can't understand. Because I think the reality is more overwhelming than the excuses we make for not understanding. And for me, Dan Flavin's work sets me off on that journey. <clears throat> and there's something about the quality of light in, of a Flavin work. It's not a wet light, it's a, it's a dusty, it's a powdery light. And it has this wonderful, this, it's almost tactile when you see it. Um, I recently went to Bridgehampton to the Flavin Institute, and um, which is a, a beautiful collection. It's almost a small survey of works. And you really can see how, the, how this artist started with the simple, and you see it in, in his catalog, there's very simple pieces that are, that are his first ones. And then they get more complicated and more layered and more, <clears throat> it's, a, it's an artist who's becoming comfortable with the medium and there's a virtuosity uh, where he has learned what the different colors of light, i.e. the different wavelengths of light will do. The red light doesn't go very far. So if you use a red bulb, you're only going to get a little bit of a red glow but the blues and the pinks and the yellow, they, they're more expansive. And you can see it in the work because the blue reflects in a bigger area. And clearly he began to understand that and work with it and take it to his advantage. <clears throat> and the combinations of certain bulbs, of certain colors, and the density of those colors. Uh, there's, there's one there that's... Um, it's a big 
wall with many dozen uh, green bulbs. I think they're horizontal. When you approach it from the side, you see green light reflected. But there's a phenomenon with these bulbs that when you turn to look at it, the color is so intense, you see white. But that piece is juxtaposed on the opposite side. I believe it's with yellow. Yes, it's with yellow. And when you look through the yellow to where the green is, there's purple. So it doesn't actually, it doesn't, the light doesn't mix entirely the way that we expect with our tempera paints. But he understood that. He took advantage of it. He exploited it for his own use, for his work. And I think that perhaps <clears throat> art may be, that may be one of the, the areas where exploitation's not a bad thing. I think in most other contexts, I don't think we, you would want to, I'm an exploiter. <laughs> There's um, an, another side effect of the reflection that I've noticed in several locations that I've, I, I call it a collateral effect. Um, what the light does in other parts of the room. Uh, at the Des Moines Art Center, they have a beautiful piece that's in the corner. It's in an IMP building from 1968. It was part of the, uh, an expansion. And Pei at that time was using very heavily textured concrete. And there are vertical channels that are smooth in the channel, but the ridge is a kind of a rough, sandy, textured surface. And the light, it's, the piece is in the corner, it's projecting out, but the light was catching in the grooves, and they were highlighted, but on the surface, where the little texture was, was all the color was broken out. There's little green and red and blue and green and red. And, this, and it was, it was this, as if it were, were alive. Now, again, that's something you can't control. You don't know what the environment it's going to be in, but you take advantage of you, you accept it. But <clears throat> and if you didn't like it, that's too bad because there's nothing you can do about it. But <laughs> You might as well claim it, right? But it made it was interesting because this past uh, two years ago, I guess, at the Chinati oh, no, thank you, at Chinati, uh, David Rabinowitz had these extraordinary pieces of galvanized sheet metal, very thin, that were manipulated and and screwed together in this beautiful cursive uh, format. From the profile, it looked like writing, but they had you know they were this wide, so they're big gleaming surfaces, and they were outside on the concrete platform. Well, the phenomenon was that they were that shiny surface was reflecting the sky. The blue of the sky and the white puffy clouds were on that silver gray, and it looked as if a piece of the sky literally were laying on the ground. It just it was fantastic. Well, the next day, in conversation with Kenneth Baker, Mr. Rabinowitz said, no, that's collateral effect. It is not the art. It has nothing to do with the art. And people were like, but it's so beautiful. He said, I don't care. It has nothing to do with the art. It's a given. It's a fact. You can't do anything about it, but it's not the art. Don't be seduced by that. And even the works that were in the temporary exhibition space, they reflect, they reflect you, they reflect the windows, they reflect the light bulbs. No. Doesn't count. You have to look at the form only that I've created. So here my love of the collateral effect of the Flavins, I'm like, ooh, maybe I'm not supposed to be enjoying that so much, you know? But <clears throat> I do, anyway. And to continue with Chinati now, uh, 
there were uh, several years ago, I had the great privilege of being invited to come to Chinati and uh, you know make some proposals and and make works of art and display works of art there. And I was invited to come to for one location, and I wound up with three. So you know, don't invite me to a dinner party because I'm going to eat the whole pie. But I, one of the venues was an abandoned building, the only one left on the campus, down the hill from the main arc of the uh, military buildings. Um, well, okay, for Chinati, as, as you all know, is the, no, it's in Marfa, Texas, is the extraordinary uh, vision of Donald Judd. And in that landscape, de southwest desert, west Texas, Physically, it lays in a, a, an alluvial bowl. It is surrounded by ancient mountains. There's a, a, a void of material that's gone. You can see 35 miles across this space to a rock that jumps 1,500 feet up from its base called Cathedral Mountain. And, I mean, where else can you see 35 miles? I think you're going to only see seven miles on flat land and at sea. <clears throat> that's the thing about the West. It's not what's there that's interesting. It's what's gone. When you go to Monument Valley and you see those extraordinary pillars of sandstone, and they're so beautiful, well, the whole thing was once full. It's gone. It's that absence that's so profound out West. And West Texas in this location begins to approach that. And I think that's one of the things that Donald Judd was seeing, this ex expanse of space. So he had a vision for his work, his work, Dan Flavin and John Chamberlain, to be seen in that context, in that location. And Donald Judd is very much about this work goes here, and it, it doesn't, certain things you can't just move around. Very much about things being in their place. Well, the concrete pieces that are out in the field are in the land, they are of, they become of the landscape. The 100 cubes inside, the way they reflect the light and take on the light, they, they are here, they're gone, they disappear, they're bigger, they're smaller. It's amazing. The Chamberlain looked like giant crumpled, I don't know, they're tossed over his shoulder, this, it just looks so casual, giant tumbleweeds. But honestly, I wasn't quite understanding Flavin in that landscape. And he had, there are six buildings with, I believe, so six buildings with two parts each. So there are 12 formations, presentations of his work. And they are orange and green. And they're, all, they're configured differently. Some you look through, some you look beyond. Uh, you approach it with reflection. So I'm down at my, this abandoned building, which I wanted to work in. The ceiling was collapsing. Owls were living in it. There were dead animals in there. I thought it was beautiful. So we scraped it out, and I would, would go, and one evening, as the sun is setting, there's this extraordinary light coming up from the mountain, from behind the mountains, and somebody has forgotten to turn the Flavins off. What, who, whatever intern maybe forgot to flick the switch. And so they were on. And you could see the color being projected out the windows at the end of these buildings. And they're kind of squared off horseshoes. The orange color that was coming out of that window was the exact same color as the sky the same color, the same intensity. It was shocking. And everything was being, you saw everything in silhouette because all of the light is behind. So the yucca plants, the building shapes, it's a big cottonwood tree, they're all black with this glow behind. Well, here's this green square that looks like, it, it, it looks alien but it's the same intensity as the orange, which is the same intensity as the sky, 
and suddenly in my mind, it stood in for the green of the cottonwood tree and all of the green, the yucca, the cactus, any other plant. And I don't know if this was Mr. Flavin's intent, but in that moment, it came together and I understood from my way how that worked fit the program of Donald Judd of seeing that work in that landscape, in that context. Nobody else is ever going to see that. Because nobody goes down the hill to that building now. And the tours are at, done at 2. And by 4 o'clock, there's nobody there. And nobody goes down there. And I, I, was, I felt very privileged to see this very unique view. <laughs> what other tangent to go off on now? Maybe getting close to a uh, some kind of conclusion. Projection, reflection, hiding in the shadow. That might be enough, because I could, I could probably go on, but um, if it, maybe, maybe questions, yes. Uh, yes, this young lady in the back. You know, I think, I don't want to reduce it that it just was an interesting backdrop for it. And I wonder if the Merce Cunningham company, uh, was, if the movement that was choreographed for that, if, for that space, I mean, how much they thought about it. Um, I, I thought it was a great performance and I was so happy to see it and the, the body movement, uh, but I'm, I'm not sure of how to address that because I was wondering while that was going on how it would have looked if it was in the Sarah room. What would have happened if it was in another room with, with different artworks? So I think you have to look in each one as a context uh, that that was a beautiful performance in a beautiful location with great works of art, and I thought it was a, it was a, a wonderful experience. Um, so I, again, I don't know specifically how that melded, but I thought it was terrific. And cute little Merce Cunningham sitting off of the side. That was really a treat to see him. It was really, really touching. Yes? It's the tube, and it's the, it's, yes, it's, it's the elements inside the tube react differently to the electron stream. And it's the same way that neon, neon gas in a tube is always red. But to get purple, you use, I think it's made, xenon gas maybe gives you green. And that's something that's very, uh, again, this kind of elemental and essential, it is of, it's happening because those are raw elements that are natural and they're making the color that they do naturally. The sun is orange because it's burning hydrogen. And you can, scientists, astronomers can look at any star and by reading its color, you know what it's made of. The flame, different flames burn at different temperatures. Orange is, kind, is hot, but not that hot. Blue is hot, white's really hot. 
and it's it's that it's that same thing, and that's that the um, he did not use gels. And I was recently um, I went out to a well, I don't know if anybody noticed my prop, which <laughs> oh, we we've, we've been waiting for that. Well, maybe okay. They don't exist. The technology is changing. Uh, even when I went to, 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 then when I got the fixture, he, first thing he gave me was this little tiny skinny bulb. So, well, that's not going to work. I'm, I, I need a surrogate. I need a stand-in, you know. And he said, oh, well, they really don't make those too much anymore. The technology is changing. The big fat bulbs are on the way out. And there's a little skinny bulb. And even the skinny bulb, he said, there's, the next generation is an LED fixture. It's going to be a long tube with LED, and it'll probably have a phosphorus coating inside, which will make the light disperse. And so it'll act in the same way. But the mechanism of the electrons going through, there's, you know, it's on the way out. So if anybody has a flavin, needs a flavin, wants a flavin, Gelb fixtures in Astoria, Queens. He says he's got a loft full of red and green and orange bulbs. But after that, that's it. That's it. So I, I got the, I got this because I thought it, first maybe we'd turn the lights off, and I would turn this on, and I'd make you all stare at a light bulb while I was standing in front of it. But I thought that was a little bit rude, um, and I, then I, I, it was it was going to serve. Of course, it's not doing it now, but it was going to serve as a prop to illustrate some of the things that I was saying. But one of the things with it is that this is not a work by Dan Flavin. This is not a work of art. It is a light bulb on the wall, pure and simple. But I don't know, my friends, myself, sometimes you're out somewhere and you see this sort of strange, odd, floating, colored fluorescent tube out there, and you say, oh, hey, look at the Dan Flavin. Well, the same thing happens with me. Anytime there's a bunch of bottle, beer bottles after a party, oh, look at the Tony Fair over here. No. It has potential. I'll come get it later. But it's not a Tony Fair. And I'd make it very clear, this is not a Dan Flavin. And it is not. A, it is not. It just isn't. Um, but as you, you see, obviously, reflection, uh, the projection, reflection, and here's that little void, that little crack of shadow that I just find that so beautiful. But the, <clears throat> this, the idea that nobody else could ever use a fluorescent fixture, it's kind of like saying, well, you know, the caves of Lascaux. I think Moreau said that um, after the caves, the painting's been downhill. So... Because somebody made a painting, you can't make another painting. Because somebody used something, you can't use it again. Well, you, no matter what, you have to make it your own. Whatever it is you do, you have to make it your own. And even if you discover something in the in sort of the, the solitude of your own uh, life in your own studio, sort of inventing your own wheel, and then you find out that somebody else, there's all these cars running around with wheels, I think as long as you came to it innocently, you can still own it, but then you need to figure out how to present it that you have that ownership. And just down the street is this extraordinary exhibition by Robert Irwin, who is exploiting the potential of these bulbs and the circumstance of the light the shadow, the project, the all of these different degrees, 
to an extraordinary degree and to a scale that Dan Flavin did not approach. So maybe that is how he, uh, Bob Irwin, is able to own it in a different way. And so your question about the configurations, I mean, I've been fixated on the color pieces because I find, as I said, the colors, I find it so beautiful and how the light moves and, and uh, how it, uh, sort of the glow of color that's coming off and the different tones and all that, I just find them so su seductive. But the Tatlin pieces, which the, at, at Beacon, I, those really seem more like drawings to me. And you see them graphically, they are lines. And there, there is a play of color because some of the bulbs are different colors. Uh, and and that it's a very subtle color change, but it is color because there's three different tones of white on some of them. But I think, I, I mean, I don't know. I, they seem almost a different body of work completely. I mean, visually they are. And I think perhaps he's approached it in a very different way. And they really do seem like drawings. And something kind of interesting is that when you're there and you're looking at how they're presented in the sequence and you look this way and then you can come back and around and you look a different way, <clears throat> it was something that I didn't notice. I don't notice only when I was looking at a catalog. And there's a group of them that the shape in the catalog, it just, it hit me. I don't, it looks like the top of the Empire State Building or a hypodermic needle. But I, so again, I don't know what his thinking was, but my thinking, if this is a tribute to Tatlin and the monument for the revolution and the new world order, perhaps one could argue that the Empire State Building is a monument to a way of a world order, obviously one of capitalism, and Tatlin was working with the conception of socialism, but somehow I found uh, a convergence and it made sense to me. What else was I gonna say? There was something, no, I'm looking up, but there, there was one other. And I wasn't going to show you that, but then I was. I thought it was more interesting. It was just laying there, and they were like, well, what's that Flavin doing laying there? But that, that hmm. Any other questions that might provoke me? You didn't, I, I didn't notice. It was only when the light... Because it, at that stage of the sunset, and because of the Davis Mountains behind, there was no light on the surface, the ground. That's why the trees and everything was in shadow. It's just the light was coming over the mountains, and it was above you. And the only reason you could see it is because there were clouds. You can't actually see light. You know, there's great photographs that, uh, of an interior of a barn, and you see the shaft of light coming down, and it's all very holy looking. And real. The only reason you see that is because there's dust in the air. You, you can't see light. You see the reflection from the surface, but you can't see light unless you look directly into it. And we all know if you look into the sun, you're going to burn your eyes. You're looking, you know, so it's not really a way of seeing. So, no, I, ne I never noticed it because, you know, I mean, my gosh, during the day, the sun is blazing out there, and uh, it's so beautiful. I re everybody should go. If you haven't been to Shinati, it's fantastic. Uh, yes? The young, young man over here?
Yeah, the, yeah, the second part is I haven't got a clue. And the ballast is the electronic mechanism inside that's altering the current and sending the electrons in their specific direction, okay? But it's the case of this. This is... Absolutely, absolutely. No, absolutely, because it's a given, and and I accept it. But it creates the shadow and provides the the separation between this light, this light, this shadow, and this. And it's the whole package that I think is really extraordinary. And you know, I, I can't go on enough about how much I love the shadow. I just I think that's fantastic. But. You asked me about the jars and the lids. I like those silver lids because I can work with them. So I like a good yellow lid too, you know, but I will use it differently. Uh, you know, <laughs> I like me a good yellow lid, I'm telling you. <laughs> but I, you know, I like that, but I will use it differently than I would use the other one. And, you know, we're Mr. Flavin alive with the new range of bulbs and fixtures that are available, there's no telling what he might have, uh, you know, what he might have started to work with. Um, I think LED is just extraordinary. A little teeny weeny little thing and you get that light out of it and it's so bright. And, um, is it Irwin Worm, is that? Yes, I'm sorry, yes. And he did a piece at Chinati, and he's, he's the artist that uses LED lights, but he creates these nets of um, electrified wire and then has them, and they just float in space. And uh, the grid of them, and I actually I didn't see the Chinati piece. I, got, I was there as a, like a day late or something, but uh, he was featured at the Whitney Biennial one year, and he had the net that was hanging in front of it. And they're just so bright and so precise and extraordinary, and they don't use very much electricity, and they last for 15 years without even thinking about it. They're, that's why um, all the street lights were changed. <clears throat> but one of the interesting things is, is they didn't change the yellow because the yellow's not on very long, and that bulb doesn't burn out. But the green and the red burn out more quickly, so they changed all those, but they didn't change that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And the green on a stoplight, now in, a, in LED, I think it's different, but on the old one, because the bulb produced such a yellow color, the glass is blue. Yellow through the blue, green. Gorgeous. Yes, there in the back, please. I, mm, I don't know. But those colors that the artist would be searching for come from natural pigments, and there's only a certain range of them. And so there's a, there's a limitation uh, right at that beginning. And they don't... There was, years ago, there was an argument. It was so stupid, but somebody was criticizing an artist because they were using neon. And this one person said, oh, that's no good that, because he didn't make the tubes and he didn't make the argon gas inside. And, he, and I said, well, did you grow the flax and weave your canvas? I mean, come on. You, you, you get it. Do you go mine cadmium and grind it? And, you know, um, when I was much younger and still attempting painting, I've, and because, um, 
anyway, just the circumstances of how I sort of arrived, uh, I went through a period of grinding all my own paint. And it was very important to me that everything was a natural pigment. And that immediately you start limiting yourself with availability, especially when you're poor and you're kind of like cruising around Canal Street and hanging out at Pearl Paint. But, uh, you know, those colors are real minerals. They really, they are what they are. And they don't fade, which is really kind of extraordinary. And a, a, an example of that, which blew me away, I, I took myself to Egypt. Um, I decided I needed to see the pyramids. Uh, and so all, I went. I'd made a little bit of money from some art, and I said, I'm going to Egypt. I, got, I have to see this. It was fascinating to me, a culture that can make the biggest things that have ever been made and put inside of them the tiniest little onyx carvings and little tiny things they, they thought they huge and petite all at the same time. They understood scale in a really fascinating way, I thought. So I went to Egypt, and my God, the pyramids, are, they're so big, you can't even see how big they are. From Cairo, they look like mountains on the horizon, and when you stand in front of them, you, there's, you, there, you can't imagine how big they are until you look and you see that the individual blocks, there's somebody standing, and the blocks are bigger than the people. The, the biggest one is almost as tall as a 50-story building. That's big. It's huge. It's a tremendous thing. But on the trip, there was, some, there was a stop um, the, the, along the Nile, it might have been in Kum Umbo, but there was a Ptolemaic period uh, temple, which is late Greek period, and up under the eaves where it had been protected from sand, and this was an exterior portico, the paint that was put there in, what, 300 BC, because it's late, after Alexander, it's still there, and it's still bright. So this, the real pigment, it, that's the good stuff. I had a, this is not supposed to be about me now. This is up to, I was gonna tell you about something about, I used a, a pigment one time that I was convinced, oh my God, I was convinced I'd found ultimately this pink color. I just wanted so much, and that's what I used at Indianapolis. I was so happy. And that stuff faded so quick. I had to go back three times and, and recharge that piece because I've not been able to find a pink, a clear pink pigment that won't fade. Who knew? My little gay grenades, and they were just fading away, fading away.